You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. All right, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And we are here. This is our first recording session in the new year. So I guess Happy New Year, Paul. Um, It's a little late for everybody else, but Happy New Year to you too. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Yeah, Happy New Year to you. (laughs) Um, so we've 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 settled on an idea here um, for an episode. Uh, we we're calling it "Think Before You Meme," I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we thought, you know, we Paul and I have social media. We go through, you know, like everybody else, Facebook and whatever, all those things, Twitter or whatever they call it. Uh, and, um, yeah, so we, we have, we have our little feeds and sometimes we see these, these little memes, um, that are, that are, yeah, sometimes they're made by creationists about creation topics. Sometimes they're made by evolutionists about creationists. Sometimes they're made by evolutionists about evolution. It, yeah, all over the map. And we thought it would be an interesting, humorous episode. And I kind of insisted on this structure. Paul's collected a bunch of them, and he's going to show them to me one at a time, and we're going to talk about them. So this may go way off the rails. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a very yeah. amusing episode. Um, so before we get started, I do want to remind you, um, you can help us out by liking this episode if you're on YouTube, um, subscribing to our channel, hitting the notification bell to let you know when new content is uh, new episodes are uploaded and published. Um, yeah, and if you're not on that channel, leave us a review. Uh, tell your friends, tell your enemies, uh, spread the word. We, we really appreciate all of your support in making that happen. Now, before we get into the memes, I did want to remind everybody, meme actually has kind of a creation um, connection all by itself. Uh, the word was coined by Richard Dawkins, no less, in his book, The Selfish Gene, back in 1976. Um, and his idea was that a meme was as a word or a little bit of culture that gets passed around and catches on and has sort of a life of its own uh, in the culture. And so he, you know, a, a meme would be something like a an advertising jingle that you, that you can't get out of your head or, yeah, a song that you can't get out of your head. Um, and, of course, on the Internet, it's now taken on, uh, it's a life of its own as basically referring to these little funny cartoons that are essentially photographs that people put captions to. And we all laugh. And we all know uh, memes, um, they're famous memes like Side-Eye Chloe and and Scumbag Steve, and you can just look up those names and find all sorts of examples of these these sorts of things. So, and I'm saying all this, I know you young people know all about this stuff, but some of us old fogies need to be reminded, oh yeah, that's what that is. Those, those little pictures you see with funny captions, that's a meme. That's called a meme. And it comes from this, this idea by Dawkins. And Dawkins would say that religion itself is kind of a, a meme all by itself, that this is what explains the popularity of religion. And, you know, sometimes I look at these memes and they're funny. I think the funniest ones are the ones that are sort of self-deprecating, the ones where, like, that, that face you make when you do something, that that's funny. That that sometimes is funny to me. Um, I don't, I'm not always a fan of memes that make fun of other people. Um, and I say that knowing that I have done these things in my life and that I am a big fat hypocrite. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I tend to wince. And it doesn't matter whether it's a meme against uh, some religious uh, position that I hold or a religious position that somebody else holds or a political position. I, it, it always makes me wince when we're going after other people like that. Um, but anyway... Paul, why don't you why don't you set us up for what you're about to do to me? <laughs> okay. Well, social media is such a big part of our lives. I mean, we can't escape it unless you're living in some hermitage somewhere. Um, and and of course, you know, social media has got its upside. Uh, so, for example, you know, recently I, I've you, 
I, I've been able to see that Todd was snowed into his house and <laughs> yeah, was right. baking snickerdoodles, um, even though I'm on the other side of the Atlantic and I have no idea what snickerdoodles are. Um, so, you know, it, ha- it allows us to kind of share information very easily, communicate with one another, stay in touch with one another. That's all good. Um, but it also has its downside, doesn't it? And yeah. um, it, it's very easy, uh, you know, on the internet to sort of get snarky and fall out with people that you don't even know. And, uh, you know, bad ideas can be spread around just as quickly as good ones. So, and of course, as Todd has already said, you know, one of the ways that ideas spread around these days is by memes, these sort of cultural memes. Um, often with a bit of sarcastic humour or, you know, some, something of that kind. And um, unfortunately, they can often spread sort of misrepresentations and falsehoods. And because they spread like viruses, you know, they, they, they can they, they go around really quickly and the truth can very easily get lost. So right. we, we thought it might be fun uh, to have a look at some memes together. And perhaps this is a kind of cautionary episode. How how not to meme? I I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I've I've got a bunch of memes. I don't know how many we're going to get through in this episode. Uh, but I've got a whole bundle here, and we'll we'll just kind of go through them. And uh, some of them are the kind of memes that creationists share around, and some are memes that anti-creationists might share around. And uh, yeah, Todd doesn't know what's coming. He doesn't know what memes I've I've chosen. So his his reaction is going to be entirely spontaneous. Oh, what have I done? So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, Todd, this is the first one, and th- this is a kind of pretty popular meme. It's been doing the rounds for for quite some time on social media. I've seen it in the form of pictures with a caption like this. I've seen it in the form of videos. And it concerns this thing called laminin, uh, this uh, molecule that you can see depicted on the right. And uh, it kind of looks like a cross. So this this molecule, laminin, is a, a complex molecule. It's one of the major constituents of the basement membrane that provides support for the cells and tissues and organs in our bodies. Uh, in fact, in the bodies of all animals, they all have uh, la- laminins. Uh, so it's a it's a molecule that kind of holds things together, and the way I've seen this portrayed is: look, you know, God has put the cross uh, right inside every one of our cells, uh, and this is kind of just what the Bible says. Colossians chapter one verse seventeen, talking of Christ, says He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And there you are. There's the cross right inside each one of our cells. So. Todd, what do you think of that? You know, I've seen this before, um, and uh, it's cute, honestly. <laughs> um, I, I know some people get kind of, I know there, there are some cell biology people who get kind of antsy about this, uh, because, of course, laminin is a very flexible molecule. It is, it is rarely, it's not rigid, it's not a rigid cross-shaped molecule. It's flexible and twisty and turny and like spaghetti. And um, so it's not going to be laid out like a cross most of the time. Uh, and as long as you just make it uh, kind of a, an inspirational picture, you know, like a pretty picture with a nice verse on it, I don't, I don't see any big deal about this. Um, if you want to turn this into an actual argument, you're going to fail <laughs> just because um, this is at best a, a cute. Um, it's cute. It's cute. That's what I say. It's cute. Yeah. Uh, that's as yeah. far as I'm going to go with it. It's not an argument. It's, <laughs> it doesn't prove that Jesus holds all the world together. It, it basically works on cells in multicellular creatures. Um, and yeah. Uh, that's that's about all I have to say about that one. It's cute. That's fine. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't really get worked up about that one. I know some people yeah. do, but it's fine. Yeah, it seems impressive to a lot of people, and it gets shared. It gets shared a lot. Yeah. Um, and and of course, it's true that 
that Christ does hold all things together. He upholds his creation. Sure. Um, and it, this is a really interesting molecule, and it does it does some fascinating things. It's you know it's it's got this really interesting structure. But can we really kind of put too much spiritual significance on the fact that it just happens to look a bit like a cross? I mean, there are how there must be thousands and thousands and thousands of proteins. Yes, right. Yes, there are and, thousands of, and and many proteins that are involved in the same sort of functions as laminin. It's not laminin is not the only one, right? And, right, and, and it's I, only I guess, a cross if you you know draw it out in that schematic way. Yeah. Otherwise, you would never really notice that that's a cross. Yeah, because I've seen photos of laminin, and it's yeah. all kind of twisted yeah. shapes yeah. and crooked shapes. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, you could probably search through the structures of lots of proteins and find interesting kind of shapes and structures. And I don't know that I'd want to put too much kind of spiritual significance on the shape of particular proteins. Nope. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, so it is what it is. This one's uh, mostly it's, it's benign, kind of, I think. This one's it's, kind it's of ben, cute. It's benign, yeah. It's not too bad. Um, yeah. The, the, the yeah. tricky bit, of course, is that you could get, you could find proteins that look like, you know, the the the, the Arab crescent. You could find proteins that look like <laughs> yin and yang. You could find proteins that look like satanic pentagram. You, you look hard <laughs> enough. The, the, those proteins are out there, too, so... Be careful. Right. <laughs> don't don't yeah. don't put too much into this. Just just yeah. not smile and nod and move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's do that. Let's let's yeah. move on from that one. So that one's that one's kind of interesting. I I thought I'd throw that in because it does get shared an awful lot. It does. Yeah. Uh, now this is an interesting one. I've actually got two memes here, but they kind of <laughs> they're, they're two versions of the same thing. Really, they kind of make a similar point. And this is kind of our first anti-creationist uh, meme. So you can see the the one on the left. Uh, you've got a couple of people who are obviously meant to be ancient Egyptians. And one is saying to the other, there was a worldwide flood. Funny, nobody told us about it. Right. Uh, and the other version, you've got these Sumerian sort of figures and uh, the caption says, the Sumerians must have looked on in shock and confusion some 6,000 years ago as God created heaven and earth. Uh, so I think, you know, it's fairly obvious the basic point that these memes are making, uh, which is to do with the, the young earth timescale. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have these ancient civilizations, Egypt or Sumer or China or whatever it is. And according to conventional archaeological dating schemes they go back a long way uh, i i don't know what does egypt go back over 3000 bc something like that very it's, old yeah 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 and Su sumer back for four and a half thousand bc or, or so on and that's that's not including pre-dynastic egypt and right you know and so on. so they have these these long histories and of course the point is this conflicts with the uh, the biblical chronology so if you just take the masoretic text of the hebrew bible which is we've been talking about in our chronology series uh creation is about six thousand years ago about four thousand bc right and uh if those dates are correct then you know the sumerian civilization was already in full flow you know this, right at right. this point when creation happens so yeah, so Todd, so, um, yeah. how do you respond to that when you see these things? So this one, I think, is derivative. I think the first time I ever saw this was an article on The Onion, which is a satirical news website. Um, oh. And I'm going to look that up and put it in the show notes to make sure we have that. It's a whole little news article interviewing various Sumerians who are kind of annoyed that Yahweh is creating things and they're trying to get their farming done. and It's cute i guess um but of course the point with the six thousand year creation is not that six thousand years ago on the calendar is when god made on the conventional calendar is when god made everything but that the entire conventional calendar is incorrect and that yeah the sumerians and egyptians are all post-flood civilizations they're not as old as we think they are um at least that would be the case if the world is six thousand years old, right? Now, if we have that, if we have that 
six thousand years wrong if it's you know if it's seventy five hundred years according to the Septuagint chronology. Um, you know whatever it, it it doesn't really matter. That's just a couple of millennia here or there. But the point being that our the creationist contention is not that if you look up four thousand BC. On your conventional calendar, that's when God made everything. It is that the entire calendar is compressed. So, in a sense, this is kind of um, a total misunderstanding of what we're trying to say. <laughs> and at the yeah. same time, yeah, I guess it's kind of cute. Um, it sort of makes me smile, even as I roll my eyes and think, you, you don't really understand what we're saying, but okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think these kinds of memes have a yeah, they're kind of rhetorically impressive to some people, but yeah. they they're sort of based on a misunderstanding as you say. Uh, right. and I I think what they represent is a kind of an attempt almost to sort of it's a kind of hybrid, isn't it, between the old earth model and the young earth model <laughs> and confusing the two. Yeah. Um to try to make some some kind of point. Um and and you can't do this. You can't just kind of take dates from one chronology and drop them into another and say, look, it doesn't kind of fit, because that's the whole point. That's um, exactly the point. <laughs> that's the whole point. So we, we don't think they fit together, which is why we think these dates have to be reevaluated. Now, now, of course, um, you know, it's a pretty radical proposal to say that we need oh. to reevaluate all of these conventional dates. Definitely. And, you know, if you want to cr criticise creationism for its radicalism when it comes to chronology fine but yeah kind of kind of do it you know understanding what it is that creationists are trying to do yeah um do you know i as i was thinking about this i kind of see this um this sort of mistake uh being made in other areas besides chronology so when people say uh there couldn't have been a worldwide flood you know four and a half thousand uh, years ago right. because there isn't enough water to cover the himalayan yeah. mountains yep yeah. and archaeology simil... doesn't support it and that sort of thing yeah yeah it's it's a similar kind of mistake yeah but, um because obviously if you're dealing with the creation model on its own terms we don't think there were himalayan mountains uh right until the time of the flood so right yeah so it's it's this problem of kind of not being able to step outside of the model the this kind of mental framework that you've got and see how somebody else might see things very differently so yeah so that's an interesting one okay this is another meme that i see creation is sharing uh again um it's a, it's a pretty popular one turns yeah. up in lots of different guises yeah uh this one you've got this sort of descent of man sort of lineup uh, you know, fairly typical thing that you used to see uh, years ago. And you've got this sort of chimpanzee-like uh, creature on one end and a modern human on the other. And the meme says, there are millions of these, millions of apes, and there are millions of these humans, so where are the millions of all the in-between species? And, uh, yeah. Now, Todd, you you have made the study of human fossils uh quite a significant feature of your work so yeah how about this is this a meme you'd feel happy sharing on, no, on your facebook no, page no, 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 no. first of all there are not millions of living apes mm -hmm. um, thousands maybe uh but the populations are all fairly small and somewhat threatened um so that is not factually correct <clears throat> and this basically this this the the but that's nitpickery. Uh the 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 point of the meme, of course, is that there's no missing links, right? There's no missing links that connect humans with apes. And on the one hand, there are technical arguments to be made that are quite um complicated, I think, and require some sophisticated analysis of the actual data at hand. Um, but, uh, yeah, the population of humans, we know, has expanded considerably, uh, historically, due to our dominance of nature. So there's really no reason to think there would ever be millions of the in-between guys. Uh, we also know that um, our 
bodies tend to fossilize poorly. Uh, and we're talking about a very short amount of evolutionary time, so you wouldn't really expect to find, even if there were millions of those individuals in between, you wouldn't really expect to find a lot of their fossils because they just don't preserve very well. Uh, where else? What else can I say? Um, and it gives the implication, of course, that's sort of implicit here, that there is a complete lack of these sort of creatures that have traits of both humans and living apes, living humans and living apes. Um, and that we know is not really correct. There are such things, and they do not, I believe, constitute convincing evidence of an evolutionary transition, but at the same time, they do exist. Um, so, yeah, I got, I got, uh, this, this is one I would just say no, no. And, yeah. uh, I would not want to get into an argument with the person who posted it because it's, it's a long, difficult, uh, explanation, much of which they're going to reject anyway. Um, because at the end of the day, when you want to say there's no such thing as a missing link, it doesn't really matter what evidence you, you're given. It that's not good enough. That evidence is never good enough, no matter what evidence is. Um, mm -hmm. So I prefer to just go back to my my analysis and <laughs> studies and avoid arguing with random strangers on the internet. <laughs> I think I think one of the ironies, as I thought about this uh, this particular meme, is that if that thing at the end is meant to be a chimpanzee, and I suspect it probably is, um, we don't have very many chimpanzee fossils no. at all. No. Um, I mean, I don't know how many, but you could probably number them on the fingers of one hand, Correct. maybe. Correct. Um, and so, in actual fact, there are more fossils that are claimed to be the, the, the intermediate forms than there are fossil chimpanzees. Correct. So, it's kind of a bit... Yeah, it's just wrong-headed at so many levels, I think, this, Correct. this meme. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, passing on. <laughs> Here's another one. Yeah. This is a cartoon. Now, I yeah. see uh, this cartoon gets passed around a lot as well. It's a famous cartoon. I think lots of people will have seen it. And uh, you've basically got uh, a couple of scientists, and they're, they're doing some complicated equations on this chalkboard here. And in the middle, one of the scientists has written, Then a miracle occurs. And the other scientist is saying to him, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of a humorous, <laughs> it's kind of a humorous uh, cartoon. Uh, and I think the point here, because it gets passed around in lots of different contexts, creationism being one of them. Yeah. Uh, and it's <clears throat> sort of trying to highlight the problem of invoking miracles as part of a scientific explanation. Uh, which creationists are said to be guilty of. So, uh, yeah, so I'm interested in your thoughts on this, Todd. <laughs> yeah, I think it's cute. It makes me laugh. Uh, it makes me yeah. smile. Um, uh, but I don't... Uh, I would say, for me, I think it, it has an important lesson here that um, sometimes we come to things that are hard to explain and we are satisfied at that point to say well you know god god just does what god does and he can work a miracle and that can solve this problem um when we're dealing with scientific explanations and sometimes i just find that to be a little lazy really um for me i i want i think invoking miracles is not helpful in science unless i have some other reason to think a miracle may have occurred. So if I have the Bible telling me that God created in six days, that's quite different than, than saying, I don't understand how, you know, the world came to be, so maybe God made it in six days. Uh, it's, it's a totally different kind of a thing. Um, and so insofar as creationists are guilty of being lazy and just inserting God into their equations to make everything work out? Yeah, I think that's a fair critique. It may be that we simply haven't resolved 
uh, the, the problem and solve things yet. Uh, but in, but as a basic critique of creationism itself, uh, that doesn't really doesn't really deal with the full the full motivation for why creationists think what we do. Uh, there's more mm. to it than just scientific evidence and our ignorance and inability to explain things. So uh, yeah, um, uh, it's cute. I laugh, but don't but don't read too much into it. <laughs> yeah it it kind of um makes you think of the whole discussion there is about god of the gaps you know this this yes, idea yes, that you know yes. you can, yeah you come across a problem that you can't explain so you kind of just put god in the gap and you say you say you know god did it and of course the problem with that is that as your scientific knowledge advances the gaps get smaller and so god is left with less and less to do right um and there's some truth in this so so there's a kind of there is a grain of truth in what this um cartoon is saying i think um it does raise some interesting questions i do wonder though you know i've got all kinds of questions here so is it possible do you think todd that you can have scientific evidence for a miracle um yes could sure. could physical evidence point to a miracle having occurred sure is that possible yes yeah, yeah, and I think you know, uh, not to go too far afield, but yeah, there are um, there are standards of documenting uh, miracles, and so if someone claims that a miracle has occurred, uh, there are ways of documenting that and ways of investigating it, and it's not beyond the realm of science. What you end up with is simply a hard just a hard sort of ignorance, a, res a resounding mm. stubborn gap in explanation that, you know, the doctors or whatever just sort of shrug and say, I don't know how this happened. Um, but when we know that, you know, somebody was praying for healing and, and had a lot of people praying for them at the same time and the cancer's just gone and the doctor doesn't know where and how, how it happened, yeah, I don't think that's a problem to call that a miracle. Uh, but I think that's quite different than saying, well, uh, you know, our understanding of radiometric dating uh, involves an enormous amount of heat generation. And so maybe God just took it away. Um, to me, that just seems like, well, that you had me until God just appeared out of nowhere to, to, to make your problem go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and, and yeah. the problem, of course, with that is that it may be true. It may yeah. be true that God has intervened in a miraculous way to make certain things happen, um, but just encountering an explanatory difficulty, I don't think constitutes enough evidence for me to say God just did this. Yeah. It, it, it just seems too easy, too convenient. God can explain literally anything, any set of circumstances, just about. Um, so I need something more than that to be able to say, yeah, that was that was miraculous. And yes, I do yeah. think there are ways of doing that. Yeah. So that's interesting. So if we could formulate testable hypotheses that surround a miracle claim, then maybe that's that's a bit yeah, different. That's totally different. Than just invoking a miracle because there's some step that we can't explain. Right. Um the the other thing is of course the God of the Gaps the, the, the standard criticism of God of the Gaps presupposes that the gaps are not real. Um, that they will all ultimately be filled, right? And can be filled naturalistically, sure. But that's kind of presupposing uh, a conclusion, and yes. that may not be true. Yes, that's um, right. The, that's the, right. The, the, the gaps may actually be real. So, uh, and and I think sometimes we can almost then go in the other direction and invoke a kind of naturalism of the gaps that says, well, okay, there are all these things I can't explain, but. Somebody sometime will explain them, yes, you know, and you just right. kind of fill the gap with naturalism. You know, right. there will be a natural explanation sometime, even if I can't think of it. Right, right, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And, and as I said, you know, some of this it, it could be that God just took the heat away during, you know, accelerated radiometric decay, and I, I, I guess after a while, uh, as we research the problem more, we're going to realize, yeah, there's no way to get around this. And 
it must have been miraculous. Um, mm. But I do think there's a lot more that can be done and said and studied and investigated before we sure. just jump to that. I, I think jumping to conclusions is bad. But again, as you say, yeah. you can also jump to the, the opposite conclusion that there must be some sort of obvious naturalistic explanation. When in fact, there may not be. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. That that was fun. Uh, right. Now here's this is a classic. Oh, no, no, uh, this, no. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know whether this kind of um, criticism of the geological column is quite as popular now as it was at one time, but it's been around a long time. It has, yes. Uh, and it it is a it is a classic from sort of creationist literature of years gone by. And you still see it floating around. So you've got this kind of this this meme here. So what it says in effect is that um, the geological column, the stack of rocks that you know with with their fossils that you see in the textbooks, um, is really just an artifact of evolutionary thinking, and it's it's a product of circular reasoning. So if you want to know how old is this rock, well, you look at the fossils in the rock and you say, well, these are at a particular evolutionary stage of development, so that gives you the age of the rock. Well, how do you know that the fossils are at that particular stage of evolutionary development? Well, that's because of their position in the sequence in the rocks. So you have this kind of circular argument, and the geological column doesn't really exist. Um, it's just this... yeah. Just this evolutionary artifact. So, yeah, is this is this correct? Oh heavens, no! <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this one's wildly incorrect. Um, it would be true if that's what scientists were actually doing. They were saying, "Well, these <laughs> rocks are this old," uh, and I know that because of the fossils in it. And how do I know the fossils that? Well, because they're found in those rocks. Um, that would, in fact, be circular reasoning. But in fact, there are multiple lines of independent evidence that suggest that there is a legitimate sequence to the rock record. Um, one independent line of evidence is the order in which certain rock layers are found. Um, they do come in an identifiable order, and that goes for the fossils contained in them, right? So if you find a dinosaur fossil, you're you know you're looking at something uh, from the Mesozoic. And it doesn't really matter. You don't really need to go through and do the stratigraphy and all that stuff to show the layering and all that. You just know that dinosaurs are found in the Mesozoic. But you know the Mesozoic exists because there's been decades and decades of uh, centuries now of research showing that these rocks occur in this particular order. And so there's, a, there's this reality to that ordering. Um, we also know it's not just the fossils that are found in the rocks that, that correlate across different geographic locations. We also know there are very often very specific chemical composition of rocks that are found in different places around the world. Permian, for example, Paul, you know this one, the Permian is associated with sandstone. We just know, oh yeah, that's going to be a sandstone, probably. Um, we know that there are certain places where you find coal beds. We, are, we know that there are certain parts of the fossil record where you find phosphate beds and carbonates and so forth, chalk beds and, and so forth. Um, and it can extend even to the very tiniest detail. We know that the end of the Cretaceous if you find a layer of rock that represents the transition of the Cretaceous, there's going to be an unusual amount of iridium in that um, in that tiny little layer there. So it's and that's an element. That's an element that is quite unusual on the Earth. And so uh, that's a that's an example where you have it down to the very specific you know atoms of <laughs> of elements that you find in rocks that are very specific to certain parts of the of the rock record. Uh, and that doesn't even get us into the whole radiometric dating issue where you can, you know, look at different isotopes and presumably infer greater or lesser age. Um, 
So there's lots of independent ways to know. There's just the, the, the way they occur in the layering, you know, low, lower things down must be older than higher things up. There's, um, there's the cross bed, the, the cross correlation of, of different compositions of rock. There's correlation of um, the fine chemistry of the rock. There's correlation not just of fossils. So, yeah, if this if if scientists were this dumb, yes, you could make fun of them with this kind of a, a meme. But die scientists are not this dumb, and frankly, they never have been. Uh, it's yeah. never been this lazy uh, that that scientists are this lazy and. And silly. It's just it's just not true. So Yeah. Not a fan of this one. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean this is this is not how, how the geological column yeah. is put together at all. So you've got these well established common sense kind of principles that rock layers are laid down essentially horizontally. Sediments are laid down horizontally because of gravity. Yep. And they build up so that the oldest layers are at the bottom and the youngest layers at the top and uh, even in un even in sequences where um, the rock layers have been disturbed by faulting or folding there are ways that you can work out you know what was at the bottom what was at the top um, and so we we can establish the sequence of rock layers and then of course you can then look at the fossils in those rock layers and then work out what the fossil sequence is so it's not circular reasoning at all. I mean, it's really just a matter of applying these common sense principles, as you say. So yeah, don't don't share this one. This Please is don't. yeah, this is not what geologists are doing. Please stop. Please stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's here's another one. This is um, yeah, this is fairly typical of a certain type of social media meme that's very sort of supercilious and triumphalist, but actually doesn't really have a lot of substance to it so <laughs> right we probably don't have to spend too much time on this it's it's like one of those inspirational posters that you kind of put up on your office wall right it's <laughs> evolution we have the fossils we win uh yeah we can probably talk about what the fossil is in this image in a moment but what what's your first reaction to this Todd? well obviously i laughed um but it was mostly a laugh of, wow, how utterly misguided this meme is. <laughs> um, yeah, we have the fossils, we win. Uh, yeah, fossils don't tell their own story. They, they, they have to be interpreted, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes fossils can be interpreted pretty well. Um, you can reconstruct, uh, you know, if you have enough fossils of, of a single species, you can reconstruct the biology of that species pretty impressively um you don't always know things right you don't know what color they are or what you know how big they are well that's not true sometimes you can reconstruct color based on molecular preservation of things but you can yeah yeah but uh, yeah there's no fossil that comes to you and says hey i just evolved and evolution is true you have to <laughs> interpret them um and so this one, however, is, I think, quite specific because it's the, the fossil depicted in this image is called Tiktaalik. And Tiktaalik is mm -hmm. one of those putative um, fish, four-legged fish fossils. They're found um, primarily in the, in the Devonian rocks, and they are, there's a number of different sorts of these, Acanthostega, Ichthyostega, and, and um, Tiktaalik. And they're all um, showing you uh, they're fish that have these strange uh, bony lobed fins on them that look like they might be limbs of some sort. Um, there are still such things alive in the world today. They are deep sea fish um, called coelacanths. Uh, and uh, so they, they're still out there. They do not use their limbs. These, these particular living ones do not use their limbs for crawling up on land and, and turning into um, land creatures, but they're still, they're still around, a couple of them. Uh, so I'm guessing behind this, there's the idea that, you know, we have all these transitional forms and you can't explain them. Um, but to me, that, that sort of begs the question of, 
you know, you, you, you're assuming that we can't explain them, right? And, and I'm happy to say in my lifetime, creationists have done a lot of work trying to understand um, the relationships of these sorts of creatures, whether they are, you know, feathered dinosaurs or uh, uh, these, these Devonian tetrapod creatures, these four-legged fish things or um, mammal-like reptiles and so forth. Trying to understand, you know, are we looking at an actual transition here or are we looking at a number of created kinds that are fitting into a niche that we no longer have in our modern world? And generally speaking, it's the latter. Um, mm. That that you, we, I'm still waiting for, well, maybe the horse series. That's kind of an example where we think the the evolutionary transition may in fact be, you know, the diversity of a single created kind. Although there are creationists who don't think that. They still think the horse series should be broken up into different different groups. And that's certainly a possibility. Um but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of assumption that goes on, goes into this meme, which makes me just think, wow, this is unhelpful. But I'm imagining I can imagine a lot of people who would be very happy to share this around and, and make fun of creationists. So, yeah, super yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, and uh, one of the other problems here is that you do, you, you're right, in the Devonian, we do actually have um, a series of these, what look like morphological intermediates, you know, between fish and tetrapods, fish and amphibians. Um, Tiktaalik is sort of part of that, that series of fossils. But uh, we also have some fossil footprints of tetrapods in Poland which predate Tiktaalik. In fact, they predate, I think, even some of the fish that are thought to be, you know, ancestral to Tiktaalik. So that kind of yeah. is hard to explain because you have this nice, what looks like a nice evolutionary series, but then there were already tetrapods <laughs> kind of walking around and leaving tracks before the series even gets going. Whoops. So. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's kind of yeah problematic. So maybe there's there's more to the interpretation of these series than than meets the eye. So yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, now this is this is a nice one. Um, now I like this meme because <laughs> although it's completely wrong, um, it does it does give us it does give us the opportunity to learn something really interesting about carbon-14 dating. Sure, sure. Uh, now, I don't know if you've come across this, Todd. Um, th I'm throwing a bit of a curveball at you here because you probably have to know a little bit about the background to what's going on here. But anyway, I'll ask for your reaction and then I'll kind of fill in some of the details yeah. if, so, if you like. So. <laughs> so the meme here, we have a picture of a snail and it says, living mollusk shale, living mollusks, shell was carbon dated at 2300 years old proving carbon dating is unreliable um so yeah the problem with the meme of course and i know this goes back i you know i can think of a number of creationist books that i knew about growing up that had these sort of tables where they would show things that were obviously historical that had these really spurious, spuriously old carbon dates or carbon dates that were just totally zany and wrong. And so there was this idea, you know, it's instilling you in you a, a distrust of carbon dating. You can't trust carbon dating because it does crazy things. And this is basic scientific reasoning 101. If you have a model, right, that explains a lot of information, um, one or two uh, contrary observations don't necessarily invalidate the model. Um, because there could be reasons for why you got that weird result in that one experiment. Most scientists uh -huh. <laughs> are most scientists are gonna reason this way. They're gonna yes. think, okay, well, I got a really weird result on my experiment. I must have done something wrong. That's the first thing that a scientist thinks. So you can show me, and this is perfectly reasonable, you can show me hundreds of carbon 
dates that are really spurious and weird. And I can show you tens of thousands of carbon dates that are probably pretty close to being reasonable. Uh, or at least in a sequence of, you know, this probably is older than that over there. Um, yeah, so, so for me, you know, you've got one spurious result here, but I don't know, mm -hmm. I, there's absolutely no context given. And it certainly no. doesn't prove that the entire model is incorrect. Um, no. I would have to know more about what these what these uh, spurious results and how are they obtained? Did they do the experiment correctly? Is mm -hmm. this a repeatable result? Did you look at a lot of different mollusks with the same mm -hmm. the same population or the same characteristics or whatever? Yeah. Um, you got to show me that this is a pattern, a recurring pattern. Yeah. And having said all that, I do think creationists have a pretty good handle on the, at least a good model for how carbon dating could produce results that are very much older than they really are. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think, I'm not defending 50,000 years old carbon dating, that, nor am I defending a 2,300 year old living snail either. Um, I'm simply saying scientific reasoning is considerably more complicated than Oh, I got a spurious result. Well, then I'm going to give up my model and go on to a totally different model. It's just yeah. not how we work. Yeah, you're, no, you're absolutely right. And um, in actual fact, uh, this is a real result. Um, it was published in a scientific paper back in 1963. And there are lots of other similar examples that you can find in the literature. Mm -hmm. And they're actually examples of a very well known effect in radiocarbon dating where you get spurious ages for um, snails, freshwater mollusks that are living in um, rivers, ponds, lakes, particularly where they're in contact with limestone bedrock. So huh. uh, these snails are building their shells uh, with carbon that they ultimately derive from their environment, right? And uh, dissolved in the water is... Uh, you know, carbon that has come from the limestone. The limestone um, is typically deficient in carbon-14, the radioactive form of carbon. Uh, and these snails are building their shells using that um, carbon-14 deficient um, carbon. And what it means is that they have an artificially old age. It's called the reservoir effect. Um, it's well known. It's discussed in the literature. This paper in particular is a discussion of that very effect. Uh, it's looking at anomalous ages, you know, that are attributable to these kinds of issues. And so really, you know, what, what it means is um, not that carbon dating as a whole just has to be thrown out. What it means is that we just have to take real care when we're dating freshwater mollusks <laughs> that are in contact with car um, carbonate bedrock. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that's even worse it, than I thought. I thought it was just bad scientific reason, but you're telling me we actually know exactly why this happens very specifically. We know exactly why this happens. And it's yes, completely we completely wrong altogether. Yes, yes, yeah. So we, we, we know exactly what, what this effect is. And, and, of and it doesn't apply, of course, to other samples like wood or bone or charcoal which derive their carbon from the atmosphere, ultimately. So, uh, so we know that the reservoir effect doesn't apply there. So, yeah, it's, it's a narrow, limited set of circumstances where we know we, we get these sort of spurious results. So, no, it's, it's not a reason to yeah, dismiss yeah. carbon dating completely. Okay. Uh, uh, how are we doing? We, I, we, we've got loads of these to get to. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're we're we, going to run out of time. time here. Okay, we've got a little more time. Um, let's see how many more we can get through. How about this? Creationism, because it's a lot easier to read one book than a bunch of hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, I've seen this in more than one uh, version. <laughs> I, I don't even, yeah. So, so uh, yes, I suppose if creationists said the Bible has everything I need to know, and I don't need to know anything else, then this would make some amount of sense. Um, but uh, 
Paul, I know you know this. Some some of these creationists are some pretty well read people. <laughs> I mean, they're they're digging up uh, I, for myself. I'm reading you know stuff from the found this the start of um, the modern scientific revolution altogether. Um, mm-hmm. I when I was teaching at at the college level, I I assigned my students to read Origin of Species, and I had one go on to grad school. And he came back and told me, you know, he took a, a, cl- a whole class in evolutionary biology with a couple dozen students, and he was the only one in there that had read Origin of Species. Um, <laughs> so, sure, yes, make it out to be like we only read the Bible and we don't need to read these hard books. Yeah. That's just, uh, yeah, it I mean, it, I whatever. Know, just, just, just makes you groan, doesn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. So, oh, there are all kinds of things you could say about this. First, yeah. first of all, the Bible. I mean, obviously, the one book that is being referred to is the Bible. Uh, and actually, the Bible itself is not one book. It's actually a bunch of books. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's 66 books. Yes. Um, yep. And uh, so I mean, that's the first thing. Uh, and of course, the reason that we do uh, place primacy on, on the Bible is because it's not like any other book. Right. You know, we, we believe that it's, it's God's word. It's inspired, right. inerrant in, and infallible. Uh, and that's why we pr- place such a high value on it. But that does not mean that we're not interested in reading other things. Um, it's I've funny. To the co- it's it's especially funny to me because Paul, you, you, I'm gonna I'm gonna out you now. You record in your dining room. That that room you're in is yeah. your dining room. Yeah. So this is and this is right overflow. Behind you <laughs> is a bookcase absolutely crammed full of books because you don't yeah. have enough room in your house. For your collection of books on creation and evolution stuff, so that is correct. And, and I have, you know, at Core Academy, I'm curating a, a library. We're we're probably up to four or five thousand books right now, all on yeah. creation evolution subjects. So I I just feel like who's this who's this meme about? Because it's not about anybody I know. <laughs> That's right. You know, one of my favorite versions of this meme is this one. Oh. Um, which is kind of a bit broader because it's not just targeting creationists, but Christians more generally. It's, yeah. a, it's got this picture of this very impressive library and it says atheist temples, more than one book available. And let me tell you, Todd, the great irony of this particular version of the meme yeah. is that the library that is shown in the image there is the library of Trinity College in Dublin. Now, the, the name of Trinity College might give you a clue. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. That, that this is one of our leading universities that was founded um, from the outset um, as a Christian institution. Its first provost was the Archbishop of Dublin uh, when it was founded by Royal Charter. Um, yeah, so the great irony of using the library of what was in effect yeah. a Christian institution yeah. to say atheist temples yeah. have more than one book yeah I've, yeah I've, I've that's been, great i've been there it's quite a beautiful place and they have a lot of yeah. um early uh early illuminated manuscripts including the book of kells um yeah. which is a it, it's a it's a collation it's a codex of uh handwritten gospels in latin yeah uh and i have a number of other extremely early um examples of of bibles that are handwritten and then they have these on display they rotate them um so that you know Mm -hmm. as a part of the conservation effort there um but yeah it's 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 beautiful i went and i loved it and thought it was great and i thought boy i wish i had a library like this (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah that's great all right okay well we come on to this one now this is a fun one is it so um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so living fossils okay so living fossils these are very popular when it comes to creationist memes yes so a living fossil is a living organism that is said to closely resemble some fossil organism uh and uh quite often what these memes do like this one is they'll put the living organism side by side with the fossil and they'll say you know where's the evolution you know why why hasn't this thing changed over time and in this particular case, you know, you've got this uh, on the right, you've got a, a shrew, a modern shrew, 
and on the left you've got this Jurassic um, mammal, which it says is a you know is a fossil shrew, 160 million years between them. They're basically the same. So you know where where's the evolution? Now I've got some things to say about this, but I don't I don't know what um well, yeah your so thoughts, my, thoughts are to begin with. My first reaction is that ninety nine percent of these represent um completely different creatures that only look superficially similar, and they're not similar at all in detail whatsoever. <laughs> so yeah, if you see these sorts of things, it's mm -hmm. almost certainly wrong because the person making the picture just doesn't understand the anatomy and the, the biology of the creatures that he's depicting or she's depicting. Uh, so that's my first reaction. Um, second reaction to this one is, in particular, uh, Mesozoic mammals um, mm -hmm. tend to be pretty fragmentary and maybe only teeth. So I'm, I don't really, I'm not really familiar with this Churamaya sinensis, so I don't really know. My suspicion is a much of the anatomy there is probably reconstructed or inferred from other fossils that we don't really have a full skeleton of that creature. So it may well be that the artist has made this look more like a modern creature than it really is. Um, so I'm a little, I'm a little skeptical of that <laughs> as well. And, and again, I might be quite okay. wrong. There might be a very well preserved skeleton of that, but I'm sort of skeptical. Uh, but yeah, yeah, my my general reaction here is that this is exceedingly uh, overstated. That most of the similarities they're they're depending on people who are not familiar with the fossils, who are not familiar with how to evaluate similarities and differences between creatures, and so you know these are people who would just look at yeah. <laughs> Just look at it very superficially and think, wow, that's really amazing that there's been no evolution. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, they're just not that similar. So, And yeah. now there are some things that I think are really interesting. Like I mentioned earlier, um, the modern coelacanth and the, um, the ancient, um, supposedly ancient Devodian tetrapods. I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, what it actually shows us about evolution, I'm, I'm not real sure. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that's my reaction. That's my gut reaction. You don't really understand yes. comparative biology. That's my reaction. <laughs> yes, well, I, I was I was instantly suspicious because you're absolutely right. You know, the, these memes often turn out to be less um, impressive than than they seem. Um, and I, I was suspicious because I know that Jurassic mammals are very different typically from modern mammals. Extremely, yes. Um, most of those modern mammal groups don't go back that far in the record. So Correct. I thought there's probably something up here. And I know that in the Triassic and in the Jurassic, you get lots of these little shrew, rodent-like mammals, you know, that, that actually belong to extinct groups that are not related to modern groups. Correct. But kind of look just superficially like shrews and rodents right. and rats and things like that so i looked up the paper oh, where good. this thing was described uh, it was described in 2011 in the journal nature and actually um it was an almost complete skeleton oh, wow. um, with okay. a pa yeah with a partially complete skull but a complete set of teeth um so it was it was reasonably well preserved and so what I did was I had a look at the description in the paper and I compared it to the diagnostic features of a modern shrew. Oh no. <laughs> now the mo so so the modern shrews belong to um a family known as the Sauricidae. And one of the things that is very diagnostic of modern shrews is their dentition, um which is very helpful because we have a complete dentition for this Jurassic animal too. Um and I had a look at the teeth. Uh, now, the teeth do not match. Um, uh, the modern shrews have a different dental formula. Uh, that means the numbers of incisors, canines, premolars, molars. So they have a different number of teeth compared to this Jurassic animal. The structure of the teeth is different. 
modern shrews have these very distinctive sort of forward projecting incisors, which the Jurassic animal didn't have. They have this very distinctive, what's called a dilamnodont tooth with a very, a very clear sort of W-shaped uh, crown. And the Jurassic animal doesn't have that, has a different kind of tooth. So there, when you look in detail at the anatomy of these things, uh, they are quite different. Um, this Jurassic mammal is a member of uh, a completely extinct group. It has no living counterparts. And I also looked at the fossil record of the true shrews, the Sericidae, the, the, the Sericidae, and I discovered that they basically go back to the Middle Eocene, uh, which is well after the Jurassic. So, so like you said, um, these are two completely different animals. They may just superficially look shrew-like, but they are completely different groups. Um, and I think this kind of confusion comes up surprisingly often and it's partly the way that science news items and press releases are written they use language very loosely so they'll often say you know this animal is shrew like or it's it's otter like or yes. it's dog like yes but what they they don't mean that it is actually a shrew or an otter or a dog, dog. that's right. not what's meant um they're talking about superficial morphological resemblances and i think lay people can get misled by that um and i've seen this happen before where people are saying oh look they've found a beaver you know in jurassic rocks and it's not a beaver it just looks a bit beaver like um yeah so we just have to be really careful when we <laughs> when we read these kinds of things and when i looked at the news items that came out when this thing was described sure enough i mean they describe it as like a jurassic shrew yeah so it's, sure yeah you know, it's kind of not surprising that you know non-specialists get they, confused by true. that yeah 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 so so maybe you know they're not entirely to blame it's um it's a kind of lack of communication really uh well right. i How think we're coming more... we're, how about one more? We've got one we more. We're coming to... up here. Yeah, this is the last one. We've, we've done well to get through them all. Uh, the, well, I couldn't resist bringing this one up. Uh, I know we've talked about this before on this podcast. In fact, when we talked about Kane's wife, we put that clip up, and I think that's the one of the most viewed clips, um, you know, from anything that we've ever we've ever produced. Where did Kane get his wife? But this, yeah, this meme is a classic. So. According to Genesis, we all come from Adam and Eve who had three sons. Think about it. <laughs> Take all the time you need. <laughs> so, oh. oh, Todd. Yeah, apart from banging your head on the desk, um, what, what can you say about this? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, number one... Uh, it's true. If you read Genesis um, chapter 4, you will only find three named sons of Adam and Eve. You will find Cain, Abel, and Seth, right? So Cain murders Abel. They have another kid who's basically they take to be Abel's replacement. That's Adam and Eve have another kid, and they name him Seth. He's the third son in the story. Now, there is nothing in that text that says they only had three sons. Nothing. And in fact, as I'm looking at this, I went ahead and got out my trusty phone Bible app here and looked up Genesis 5, chapter 4, I'm uh, sorry, chapter 5, verse 4. Let me read this to you, Paul. The days after Adam fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So think about that. Take yeah. take all the time you need. Um, <laughs> you, you you just you, you just it, if you're gonna make fun of somebody, at least understand literally what you're making fun of because uh, that's just stupid. Sorry, but it is just it's just stupid. Anyway, 
Yeah, if you're going to write a snarky ne- uh, meme about uh, Genesis 4, at least check out Genesis 5, you know, because <laughs> just to make sure you haven't missed anything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, a- anyway, right. Well, we've kind of got through all of the memes that I've got. Um, I think it's obvious that there is a lot of um, bad information going around on social yes. media. Yes. Uh, lots of these memes perpetuate sort of misunderstandings and falsehoods. Um, some of them have a grain of truth, but they perhaps sort of make the point badly or they really grossly oversimplify what's a very complex um, issue. So I think, uh, you know, what would be our advice, I suppose, to to our viewers and listeners, you know, before you share these kinds of things, um, check out the truth of what it is that you're sharing you know look look at the source of the information is is it reliable is it is it trustworthy is the claim that's being made really true and i would say if you're in any doubt just don't share it don't you know i would say just don't share it period (laughs) (laughs) if it's a creation evolution meme you're much better off just not passing it on at all yeah, because it's not likely going to be a fair. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of how many creation memes I've seen that are actually correct because yeah, that's so unusual and rare. So yeah, just don't, just don't, yeah. just stop. Just and, and apologies to everyone who made these memes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, yeah. but you 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 really got it quite wrong except the laminin person so long as you don't get too carried away that's that's cute i guess um yeah yeah um and having um sort of trawled through the backwaters of the internet i want to end with something that kind of will elevate us a little bit (laughs) um so uh i i want to read a verse of scripture which is philippians 4 verse 8 because i think it's very relevant to this issue of social media Uh, And it says this, this is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Very good advice from from the Apostle Paul. Uh, We've run out of time. Um, it's been a fun episode. I've I've enjoyed seeing Todd's reactions to these things. Uh, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks. Um, do make sure that you join us then. Click that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Um, tell your friends about us. And we will see you in a couple of weeks' time. We'll see you then. See you later. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.